stand here and push the buttons on this thing, and I just noticed your clock is permanently, well, it's stuck there at 7.04, so uh, you people are in trouble now because uh, I was going to talk for maybe 45 minutes. This could be a long 45 minutes that uh, that clock was. Uh, uh, I don't, if you, these people go to sleep if you shut them off. I, don't know, I, I think it'll be fine if it looks like we need to we can do that. Very good. And, and I appreciate the, the chance to visit. Actually, what I really appreciate is the chance to uh, talk about something other than earthquakes because I, all I have done for the last 18 months is deal with earthquakes. And it's probably all I will deal with almost all the time. And I think I've given four earthquake talks in the last week. So, so it's kind of nice to do something else. And when I get done, if you want to hear about earthquakes, uh, then to, to talk about them. But that's not really what we're doing here tonight. Uh, and most of you, I, I know a few of you, but I don't know very many of you. So you, uh, I'm sorry, John, but you've heard a lot of these jokes before. Uh, <laughs> but I always tell people that, uh, that uh, and Greg didn't mention this, which is really unfortunate, but I co-authored co this book called Roadside Kansas with Jim McCauley. And uh, uh, you're always supposed to plug your guest speaker's books, Greg. Just so you know. <laughs> so now I'm forced to do it. Really? Now I'm forced to do it. Let's see, what are we? We're in August. What's coming up? Labor Day. You know, it's not common to give gifts on Labor Day, but it, you might think about it. Uh, and I tell people, or oh, right after that is Halloween, and uh, you know, candy is not good for children. But think of the satisfying plump that a book would make in some child's sack. So just, yes. The the other thing about that book is, if you take it with you on your travels. You always have something to look at and something exactly. to talk. Thank you. Uh, and the other thing about that book is there's a lot of things in there that are true. And, uh, <laughs> even if they're not, they're interesting. That was the bar. You know, it was interesting first, and then we'll worry about the, the details later on. Anyway, when that book came out, uh, I was having breakfast with a friend of mine one morning who teaches English at KU. and. Uh, and this guy said uh, he had just picked up a copy of that book and he really liked it and he especially liked the way that we made water a subtext of the book. I grew up on a little farm in the middle of Kansas and I didn't take very many uh, literature courses in college and to be honest I didn't really know what a subtext was and to be even more honest I'm still not really sure what a subtext is today but I don't like looking silly any more than anybody else does, so I said, well, thank you for noticing. <laughs> <laughs> but what I came to the realization was that, I, that it was kind of the subtext of the book. He had noticed something in reading it that I hadn't even noticed in writing it. But I think the reason for that is you can't really talk about this state without talking about water. I think you just it, it just informs who we are as a people and what we do and where we live. And, so much about us that it would have been impossible to do that book in any other fashion. So, uh, now I will say, I've always sort of been suspicious when, when English, are there any English professors in the room before I insult you all? I've always been impressed when English professors see all these things in novels and stuff that I don't ever see. You know, I always think, is that really what the author meant? Or are those guys just good at seeing stuff? I, uh, Anyway, so we're going to talk about water, and I think what I'll do, I will cover a few things here, but I may skip over a few parts and maybe try to get to, I'll, I'll do some statewide stuff, but then I think I'm going to try to get to something pretty analogous to the kind of Flint Hill setting you all are in in terms of water. So we may skip past a few things as we go through this. Just real quickly, uh, just to sort of set the scene here, this is a map that shows really a couple of things. One is, uh, Average annual precipitation. And I was thinking about this driving in tonight. Uh, those lines go from 20, those, those are the dotted yellow lines, and obviously go from less than 20 inches a year out west to 40 sun in southeastern Kansas. Uh, but I've always thought that, that, that average annual precipitation one of the most misleading numbers you could ever see for the state of Kansas. Uh, a few years ago, I did a paper about the place where I grew up, which is in Rice County, right here, right in the middle of the state. Average annual precip, 24, 25 inches a year out there. But I looked at the annual records for 60 or 70 years, and what I found was 
there were very few years when we had average annual precip. It seemed like we always had a lot more or a lot less. And this year is a little bit of an example of that. You know, the last three or four summers, we had extremely dry years. I mean, there were parts of western Kansas that had total precip of four or five inches. And now this year, I don't know what it is. I don't know that you're above average, but you're, you're probably doing average this year, if not above. And there are certainly parts of western Kansas that are way above average. And that seems to be true. That is, we either tend to be way high or way low, and we're very seldom at these averages. But having said that, that's what those averages are. And then the other thing are general availability of groundwater. And the dark blue is where you can, in very general terms, expect to drill a well and get 500 gallons of water per minute or more. And just sort of be clear, groundwater is that water that's found in underground pore spaces of rock or sand and gravel. It's typically in Kansas not found in underground lakes or rivers or anything like that. We'll, we'll talk about the Ogallala formation in a second. Because that Ogallala is what most of that dark blue out in the western third of the state is. Uh, the other parts of it, the light blue is 100 to 500, and then the green is less than 100 gallons per minute. And those are very general, it's a very general map, and I'm sure you could point at places where things that isn't true within that map. But the point is, there's a lot of groundwater out west, not very much groundwater in eastern Kansas, except right along rivers, whereas there's a lot of surface water in eastern Kansas because of all the precip, but hardly any surface water out west. So really, Kansas is two completely different states when it comes to water. Out west, there's a lot of groundwater, but no surface water. In eastern Kansas, there's a lot of surface water, but no groundwater. So, and, and I really hesitate to say this after the conversation John and I just had, but I actually have some sympathy for the Kansas legislature. Well, you don't hear those words very often. <laughs> uh, but to try to come up with laws and rules and regulations to deal with water in Kansas is very difficult when you've really, in effect, got one state that's spliced in, that's been spliced in two pieces and made, uh, made one. It's really a challenge to deal with water issues in this state as a result because it looks so different from one end of the state to the other. And one way of going about looking at this, and so what we're going to look at Real first here is surface water versus groundwater. I said before, groundwater is water found in the subsurface and pore spaces of rock. Surface water is lakes, streams, ponds, stuff found on the surface. And one way of dividing the state up is not according to political boundaries, but river basins, basically drainage areas, common areas of drainage. Uh, one of the heroes in the world of geology is John Wesley Powell, first guy to go down the first white guy to go down the Grand Canyon and uh, was director of the U.S. Geological Survey. And Powell proposed divide, dividing the West up into drainage bases and, and basically uh, governing the West according to drainage basins as opposed to political boundaries. Those political boundaries, we all know, are artificial. They don't make any real sense other than a way to measure ground. If, Wesley, if John Wesley Powell had, had his way, Kansas would probably look more like this map than what it looks like with the underlying political boundaries. Now this is a map that the Kansas Water Office uses for some of their guidance in terms of developing water policies for the state, but uh, you can really see that in some respects that works, but in other respects it doesn't. Yeah, and when, they, when, this first map, when this map first appeared and the Water Office was using it, on one hand, I think it's really smart to look at the Smoky Hill drainage, say, as one big common area. But what Wallace County has in common with with Dickinson County, you tell me. I mean, they're both in Kansas, and runoff all both goes to Smoky Hill. But beyond that, they're two very different places. So that's one way of looking at it: is surface water drainage basins. Now it's a little hard to see the title on this, but this is the use of water divided up into groundwater versus surface water. Okay, and uh, the guy that did this map for me he always calls this a Pac-Man map because <laughs> these little dots look like that. But the red is the percentage of uh, surface water that people use, and blue means they use a lot of groundwater. And that map pretty much reflects that earlier map I showed you of a lot of groundwater out west, a lot of surface water back east. And let's see, Riley County is right about there. It looks like it's, I don't know, just eyeballing probably 80% use of, uh, of surface water. And that's probably, you all get your water from uh, ground, 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 ground water. Uh, Grandma, I'm sorry. But you're probably alluvial wells out of the 
the river, 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 river valley, right? Uh, yeah. I would assume yeah. as you're. Do you get any the, uh, municipal water out of Total Creek or not? No. No. Well, no. our wells are only 100 feet off. In effect, you do. Exactly. And, that, and that, that's a good point, is that groundwater and that surface water are very connected entities. And in a lot of respects, you really are using surface water and just you're pulling it out of groundwater. They have to monitor it for the first 10 years as if it was surface water and then finally yeah. put yeah. it groundwater now. So it, they are so connected that that division that I'm using is a little bit artificial, but it is what the way people look at it. So, so predominant irrigation out west and, and surface water back. Uh, the, groundwater out west, surface water in the east. But if you total all this up, there's not too much question about what the big use of water in Kansas is. And I think that number is actually about 85% for irrigation. Now, you may go back to this map and say, well, geez, look at all the red dots, especially in eastern Kansas where all the people are. I mean, wouldn't municipal water use be much greater than irrigation? But you can see it really did not show up very high on this map. And the reason is, even though there aren't very many people out west, they use a quite a lot of water for irrigation. We'll talk about that more. Recently. Okay, I'm going to briefly touch on a couple of surface water issues. They may relate. They do relate to you all here, uh, somewhat. Not so much right on the cons of it up at Tuttle Creek. Uh, I'm not going to talk about a lot because I don't. My world is groundwater, not surface water. But the big issue nowadays in surface water in Kansas is reservoir siltation. You you hear it talked about constantly. These Corps of Engineers and Bureau of Reclamation reservoirs that we've got up and down all over the state are silting in. Now, I don't think that's any huge surprise to anybody, including the people that built them. Everybody expected them to silt in. Some of them have silted in a little faster than they thought they were going to. Others a little slower, but I don't think anybody's usually surprised. I think it was what everybody expected. And this is a map of Perry Reservoir over by, uh, by Topeka. And it starts off in 1974 when you can see a lot of open water up here. 91 and 2001 is the thing that silts in on the upper end. And you guys have got the same issue up at Tuttle Creek. If you go over that, the other day I had a field trip and coming over the bridge there at Randolph, and, and you know, it's pretty much mud flats. And it didn't used to be up there, but today it is. So the question is, what do you do? Because we have become extremely reliant on these things for sources of water. I mean, you all don't rely on directly, but you kind of do indirectly. Certainly in Lawrence, we get a lot of our water out of Clinton Lake. Uh, we're relying for water supply, for recreation, for some irrigation places. We now depend on these things. For them to be obsolete because the siltation is not really in the cars. Uh, so what do you do? Well, the poster child for this issue is uh, John Redmond Reservoir up by Burlington. And this no, that's probably my DM phone. I apologize. I shouldn't call it. Uh, nobody ever calls me. That's why I don't ever hear <laughs> What that means. Anyway, this is not this is not John Redman, but this is the, the lake next door to it that supplies the, the cooling water for Wolf Creek nuclear, I can't say that word, generating plant. Uh, so there I've made the argument a lot in, in conversations lately that to look at water and energy as separate entities is kind of silly because they're really co-joined things. And this is a poster child for that. The cooling water for Wolf Creek, in effect, comes out of John Redmond. It goes from John Redmond into this thing, into this lake, and then cools the power plant. But you've now got a billion dollar power plant that's dependent upon that water. You've got people that are dependent on that electricity. That lake cannot go away just because of siltation. Now, this is that lake, and the average depth on John Redmond Reservoir today is eight feet. <laughs> if you didn't sink down into the sill, you could almost walk across that thing. It's a big lake. It was relatively shallow when it was built, and it's, it suffers from siltation more than almost any of these reservoirs do, so what do you do? Well, the answer the state of Kansas has come up with is dredging. And the state is getting ready to spend $25 million a year to put a dredge out there, take that uh, silt off, move it to a location down to load the dam. And that process is actually going to start this fall. We'll do ground prep this fall. It's the first, first Corps of Engineers lake in the uh, country in which that's going to be done. And the, as I understand it, the amount of dredging that $25 million a year buys you is about enough to keep even with the inflow of sand. So it ain't a solution. I mean, it's a 
stop grabbing them, stop gap may not be quite the right word, but you get my point. You're not getting ahead of the game, and this is one of 20-some reservoirs. We got a big issue here in a state that can't seem to find money to do anything. So uh, this is a big time issue, and on the surface waterfront, this is the dominant topic of conversation, that is. This is where that silt comes from. This is up above John Redman, and, and it's not too hard to imagine uh, you know, these banks caving in, and you know, typically the stuff arrives, as I understand it, big pulses of silt as you get big rain events, and, and, and it's, it's not a constant. It flushes in in you know, big amounts. So that's, that's one of the things we're struggling with. This is another issue that I think is equally important that you don't hear conversation about. This is a map, and I, this map isn't updated, or it could look even worse, but it's basically perennial streams over time between 61 and 94. And there are a variety of things going on here, but at least one of the sources of the, that change in stream flow, there, there are at least a couple obvious ones. One is alluvial wells, particularly along the Arkansas River. And you were talking about alluvial wells, basically what you get your water supply from. You put, the alluvium is the, the kind of silt and sand and gravel that neighbor, is neighboring a river bed. And you put a well down in it, and you can produce a lot of water. It's almost like you're taking water out of the river, but not quite, if you get my point. So there are a lot of alluvial irrigation wells along the Arkansas River, and that's one reason that west of Garden City and, and, and east of Garden City and west of Great Bend, it in fact doesn't exist today as a river. It's gone. But it isn't only the arc. The arc's the worst of those, but you can see the reduction of stream flow. Some of that is alluvial wells. Some of it is conservation effort because when you put in terraces and you keep water on the ground, which is a desirable thing for soil erosion, you slow up the ability of water to run off and get into those streams. And I think if there were an environment, I, what was it, a couple years ago, John, I was over here and gave a talk at some environmental conference up on campus, and somebody asked me what I was concerned about environmentally, and I kind of went off the deep end. I was in a bad mood. It was a Saturday morning. And, and, I had a bad experience earlier in the week with a talk, and, and uh, everybody was all concerned about fracking. And I, and I said, well, my answer to that question, what would I worry about? This gap right here. And I never, I never hear anybody in this dang state talk about it ever. And for the life of me, I don't understand why. We've lost it. You know, the major river in the state, people are surprised when there's water in it. Well, that's a hell of a thing to say. But I never hear anybody talk about it. We've gotten used to it. We go out there, there's dead cottonwoods, there's nothing in it. It's growing up in salt cedar, and I don't hear a peep out of this state. Yeah, I think, well, you're out there. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was telling John, I'm going to retire in about a year, and I see what's going on. I get a little more obnoxious about my own opinions all the time. Okay, let's talk about groundwater. That's that same map. Groundwater, I said before, it's found in the poor spaces of sand and gravel. And, some, some kinds of rock make better aquifers or sources of groundwater than others. Uh, sand and gravel is a good one. Uh, limestones, like the ones you have out here in the Flint Hills, they store more groundwater than you think. And I'll show you some pictures of that here in a minute. But first, we're going to talk about the high plains of the Ogallala Aquifer, because Greg was talking about groundwater depletion, and this is really the name of the game in terms of groundwater depletion. Now, well, I, I don't know why Brownie puts these things in yellow, and I can barely see them. <laughs> the High Plains Aquifer is an all-encompassing term, and the Ogallala is a subset of the High Plains Aquifer. So you've probably heard of the Ogallala, and you might not have heard of people calling it the High Plains. But in Kansas, and it covers all of those eight states, and it's in sand and gravel that washed off the face of the Rocky Mountains. But in Kansas, that's the Ogallala part of the High Plains. All right, so when you hear people talk about the Ogallala, this is what they're talking about. The, there are other parts of the High Plains Aquifer that we're not going to talk about today. But they're similar but different to, from the Ogallala. They have Great Bend Prairie, and then the Equus Beds is where Wichita gets a lot of its water. The, and one of the real points I want you to remember, and I'll hammer on this in, again, the Ogallala is not one big sponge down there. Okay? It's not one big underground swimming pool. You could not drill a big well into the Ogallala and send down some guy in a skin diving suit because it's not like that. It's saturated sand and gravel, and it's highly variable from place to place. 
So what the Oglala might look like in the subsurface here and what it might look like over here can be two very different things. Over there it might produce a lot of water, over here it might not produce any. So it's variable from place to place. And that's important as we begin to think about management of it. Let's talk about irrigation. This is flood irrigation. It's the kind that when I was a kid was far more common than it is today. Hard, you see it today some, but not a lot. Uh, basically, you put a pipe along this end of the field. There are holes in that pipe. Water comes out of those holes and it goes down the furrows of the field. Now, I grew up on a dry land farm, so I never had the pleasure of hauling this pipe around. I don't know if any of you all have. If you have, I've heard a lot of horror stories about it. Uh, I had a lot of bad experiences farming, so I, I, I won't yield to this particular problem, but I, I have heard stories about moving gated pipe. The problem with this technique is you've got to have a relatively flat field for that water to, to do what you want it to do, which is flow kind of downhill to the other end. And if you don't, and even if you do, you're in a, what you want is a field that is flat but not level. I love that sentence because it sounds kind of zen like. Uniform. Yeah. You want it tilted just slightly so the water will go down there. But even with that, you have to put a whole lot of water on up here to get a little bit of water down here. It's a very inefficient way of applying water, but that's what everybody did for a long, long time. So, but then in the 50s, people began to use center pivot systems. You all have seen these things out for this. Uh, Basically, big lawn sprinklers. So back when I was a kid, everybody these all shot water up into the air real high, but that's inefficient because water evaporates. So they put these drop down nozzles so that the water will be on the, in the canopy of the corn won't evaporate before it can get away. Uh, in fact, nowadays they're beginning to use what they call drag lines, which is just drag that, that, that water releasing line right down onto the ground so that it's not up in the air at all, trying to get even more efficient. So that's a center pivot system on the ground. This is a view of the, of the things from there. I'm sure you've all flown over the state and seen these things. Uh, this is why they are there. When I was a kid, uh, I grew, like I said, I grew up on a farm. We raised cattle, and the cattle always went to either, mostly they went to Wichita. Sometimes they would go to Kansas City or Omaha to a packing plant when I was a kid. Today, there aren't any packing plants in any of those towns because packing plants are all out west. This is one, it's no longer an IDP plant, it's now a Tyson plant, this is in Holcomb, west of, of, uh, of Garden City. And uh, at one time, this was the world's largest beef packing plant, kill a 5,500 head of cattle a day. This is where they come in, they come, cattle don't like straight lines, they're easier to move if you can get them going around curves. So this is curved, they go up in this little chute, this white chute, they go into this building and then they come out in boxes. Uh, that packing plant, along with four other big packing plants, is out west in Dodge or Liberal or Garden. And it's out there because there are a lot of cattle out there. Those cattle are out there today because there's a lot of corn growing out there. And the corn is out there because of the Ogallala aquifer and the irrigation that takes place today that didn't used to take place. Whoops. Okay, let me see what I did here. Well, anyway. Okay, so I've shifted scales on my map here. This is the this is the high plains in Kansas. This is the western half of the state. This is McPherson County. Here's Finney County, Garden City. Okay, getting oriented now. Liberal and Stevens County, Cheyenne County. Here's Goodwin and Coley. All right, everybody with me? And this is the aquifer before we begin really developing it for irrigation. And in places, down in southwestern Kansas, you've got, this is saturated thickness. It's the amount of that overall formation that's saturated with water, okay? So where it says 300 feet, there's 300 feet of sand and gravel that's water saturated. That's what saturated thickness is. It's a pretty easy term to handle. And again, remember my point about how variable the overall is? This map shows it in spades. Down in southwestern Kansas, in places it's 300 feet of saturated thickness. Up here, maybe 100 feet. It's not all created equal. And this is all pre-development before we start large-scale pumping, and really the 50s, all right? So we begin to see declines in the 50s. And there was a period where you can look at the literature and people will talk about water in Kansas the way they talk about 
every other natural resource in the history of mankind, which is there's so much of it we can never use it all. <laughs> well, in the 50s, people begin to figure out we can use it all, but now we begin to measure how fast we're using it and what the declines are. Every January, I go out with a group of guys and we measure water levels in each one of these little dots, 1,400 wells across western Kansas. And uh, I, like I said, I grew up on a dry land farm, so this world is kind of fascinating, this irrigation world is kind of fascinating to me. Basically, you go out and you uh, drop a, you take a tape measure and you put chalk on one end, carpenter's chalk, you drop it down into these holes at the base of the pump if you can find it, and then the water washes off blue chalk at a certain level, you pull it up, you do some math, and you can tell how far it is to the, to, to the water level. And this is actually me doing that, and I like this picture because catching me working is like wildlife photography. <laughs> <laughs> you have to lie and wait for years. You know, those pictures of the lions eating the gazelles, that's the same thing. It's like, this guy took his picture, must have been there for months in order to study this one brief, shiny moment. But I, this is January, and I like doing this in the years when the weather is nice. And I remember this day. We were out in southwestern Kansas. It was mid-January. It was probably 85. It was just a gorgeous day. But it's not always like that. Some days it's like this. Last year it was like this. And uh, I mean, this picture is a classic western Kansas January picture. I and mean, I, I just look at this and I start to shake. Because uh, you got to go out there and find a well in this uh, snow and, and flat horizon kind of thing. Actually, I love it. It's, it's actually it's my idea of a good time. We use GPS to get us to the right well, and then we we enter all these numbers in a computer, and uh, we get results. And so, <coughs> what this shows is, and I think let me show you this. This is a graph of the decline in the water table over the entire High Plains region of Kansas year by year. So this covers. I mean, that's I'm moving fast here. All of this is the High Plains in Kansas. All right. So this graph is the decline in all of those areas. Again, because the Ogallala is so different from place to place to place, in some places that decline is much greater than other places. So if you graph it out over the whole thing, over this period from 96 to 2014, it drops 14 feet, okay? Which doesn't sound too bad. The average drop in southwestern Kansas the last few years when it's been really dry, we've had annual drops that average about four or five feet. Now, the recharge, and I may have a map of that. I'm, I'm, I'm bouncing around on you guys. I'm sorry. But this is the recharge, the natural movement of the water back into the ground. It's as much as three or four inches, the same scale map. Here's Wichita, Liberal, Midland, Colby. Okay. If you stay in central Kansas, you might get four to six inches a year of natural recharge. Out here, a half an inch. So if you're taking it out of southwestern Kansas at the rate of 48 inches a year, and the natural replenishment is a half an inch a year, in effect, it's a non-renewable resource. Mm -hmm. People think of water as a renewable <coughs> resource, but in the way we're treating it, we're not. It's not. We're mining the resource. We have been for, for a long time, actually. And this is sort of what this looks like. There are various ways of showing you all this. This is the change in, in uh, in total feet. That's one way of looking at it. And the biggest declines, southwestern Kansas, 150 feet. You're probably going, wow, 150 feet of decline in the water table. But keep in mind, these guys started off with 300. Up here, the total absolute declines may be, what, 50 feet, but they only started off with 100. So not all is created equal here. Here's a way of showing that also over time lapse. And I, that's why I kind of like this. It's an animation. And basically, the, 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 the hotter the colors, like red, is the bigger declines. And you can see those things sort of blossom over time. This is absolute decline in feet. All right? And again, what you see is really pockets of declines, not uniform declines all over the whole thing. Now, it looks most severe down here because absolute declines are greater, but you see some bullseyes in other places there, too. Each of those dots is a well that we measure. 
So another way to look at this is not absolute decline in feet, but a percentage decline. That's probably a better way to look at it because if you had 300 feet to start with and you take out 150 feet, you still got 150 feet there, but you've had a 50% decline. So it tells it's another way of looking at it. Maybe not better. But this will show you the percentage decrease. And where you then begin to zero in is some of these areas that didn't have much just water to start with like West Central Kansas, like Scott and Greeley and Wichita Kansas. That's where you really get hit hard is when you didn't have much water to start with. Down here, even though we had some big declines, they've still got quite a bit of water left in places. So there are a variety of ways of looking at this issue. But this is, kind of, this is the answer, and then we'll move off of groundwater after this. The question is, how, much, how long will the overall last? Okay? It's not a renewable resource, it's a finite resource. We're using it faster than it's being replaced. How long is it going to last? Well, that's a tough, lab, tough question to answer because it's affected by a lot of variables that we can't predict. We don't know what commodity prices are going to be. And when corn prices go up, they use more water because they grow more corn. Commodity prices go down, they use less water, they grow less water. We don't know what corn prices are going to be. We don't know how much it's going to rain. When we go out to measure waters this, water levels this coming January, we're going to see far less in the way of declines in January than we saw the previous two years. Not because any more water is getting in the subsurface, they just didn't have to pump as much. I took the train to Flagstaff for a meeting in mid-June, and in ordinary June, you'd see water pumping, you'd see irrigation pumping everywhere. They were all shut off because it had been raining. So we won't see those big declines in January. But we don't know if it's going to rain in the future, if it's going to be dry in the future. We also don't know energy prices. And it costs a lot to lift water. Water's heavy. And the deeper it is, the more it costs. So or it, there used to be people where I worked that said this problem will solve itself when energy gets really expensive. I can't tell you how many times I heard that. When, inter, when electricity gets really expensive, when natural gas gets really expensive, they're not going to be able to lift this water anymore. That will solve depletion of the overall. Well, here we are in 2015. <laughs> oil prices are so low that people are about to jump off of buildings in Wichita. Energy is not a controlling factor. But it could be something, but it's not. And we don't know those things. We don't know commodity prices. We don't know rainfall in the future. And we don't know energy prices. So what we do is project how long we think the aquifer will last based on declines over the last 10 years. And this map shows you how many years we think are left for large-scale irrigation in each of these areas. So again, same scale of map that you've been seeing before. The hotter colors are shorter amount of life for the aquifer. And you see reds here in some places in southwestern Kansas. You see in, in this, this color, whatever it is, it's, they're all ready to go that threshold. In effect, the game's over here. And it's, it's either over or almost over in all parts of Northwestern. Now, it's important to remember what I said, that this is lifetime based on large-scale irrigation pumping. Because these irrigation pumps, they take a lot of water, 400 to sometimes 1,000 gallons per minute. For a domestic well, you get by 10 gallons a minute. So don't get the idea that these people are going to wake up some morning and turn on the taps and no water comes out. It's not going to be like that. What it is, it's sort of a slow motion disaster. And man, it's slow motion disasters are the things we are worst at dealing with, aren't they, then, John? I mean, it's those slow motion car wrecks that we can't figure out how to handle. If this was people flying airplanes into skyscrapers, we'd have solved it. But it's not. It's this incremental drip, drip, drip of a problem. Now, what we do about all this is another story, and I'm not going to touch much on it. Uh, but I will say this is a very difficult problem to solve in, in the, the way we go about life. And the, wa the water office and the water and division of ag, or department of ag in the state are out developing a 50 year vision for water use in the state even as we speak. <clears throat> but coming to a consensus about something that will solve this problem, I have yet to see in the state. I've been watching for 40 years now, and we're no closer to the solution than we were 40 years ago. Well, that's not completely true. But it's pretty close to true. There are some things. There have been very many. 
these are groundwater management districts, and the, the idea of being that in this state, the idea was that local units of government would do better at solving this problem than state government would, right? Because if you live on the ground out there, you know the problems better than some dork in Topeka sitting behind the desk. That was the theory. It hadn't really worked, but that was the theory. Uh, and there are a lot of reasons it hasn't worked very well. Let's see. I'm going to shift gears on you now. I don't know how time it is. What, how are we doing here? It was 7.49. Okay. I'm going to shift gears and just tell a few stories and finish up. And, and I'll, I'll focus on Flint Hill stuff. Uh, like I said, water is a critical part of our history. And this is about a mile from where I grew up in the middle of Kansas. And it's an, a Native American petroglyph rock carving on Dakota sandstone right above the spring. The spring is, you know, would be about floor level. Uh, when I was a kid, everybody told us that this was a drawing that represented uh, like uh, ripples in a pool as if you threw a stone into water and it ripples went out. But I, and I repeated that story a few times. But if you look here, you can actually see feet. And you can see the spear, obviously, and there's actually a little bit of a head right here. This is a sheet. It's not a symbol for water. But it is no accident, I don't think, that it's found where <coughs> water is found. And if you go to, and particularly in central Kansas, an awful lot of springs, you'll find these kind of carvings around. People have made that connection between human habitation and water for longer than there have been Europeans here in Kansas. This is a, and I know you're looking at this scratching your head, this is a, that was a petroglyph. That's a rock carving. This is a pictograph, and that's when you use pigment to draw on a cave wall or on a rock. You can't really see it very well. This is what it really is. This is a figure that was drawn onto this gypsum cave down in the Red Hills down by Medicine Lodge. It's up on top. I know you can't see it, but it's there, trust me. Um, <laughs> not drawn on this gypsum, probably with either pigment or charcoal. Now, it's really even harder to see today. But again, there's a spring right down below it. There's no question there's a connection there. This is the inside of where that cave is. That, that figure I just showed you, it would be right up in here somewhere. And this is water coming out of this cave. And this is me. Uh, because when Jim McCauley and I were working on Roadside Kansas, we developed a cave policy. And our policy on caves was that we would enter no cave that we could not ride through in a jeep. <laughs> and, uh, so that's why you see pictures of me outside the cave and somebody else took those pictures inside. Uh, this is another connection. This is Alco Spring. It's pretty close to you. How many of you have been here? Oh, oh good. A lot. Great. Uh, this picture, this, the spring is actually, the spring is right here. This is a waterfall that most of it, sometimes it runs and sometimes it doesn't. The spring's at the base of the cedar tree. And I, and I guess the Topeka Symphony is going to do a symphony up there on uh, May 6th, or uh, September 6th. Yeah. Uh, when we first started going there, that was on private property. And uh, we had to go to Blue Rapids and find the landowner to go in there. Now it's part of the trust, and you can just park on the road and walk in there. It's a cool place. You can see wagon ruts from the Oregon Trail. Speaking of which, I'm really bad about tangents. There's a new book called The Oregon Trail about a guy who recreates a trip on the Oregon Trail with a mule-drawn wagon all the way from Marysville, Kansas to Oregon. I just finished it, and it is a cool book. And that had nothing to do with what I was just talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, if you, again, but this place was a stop along the Oregon Trail, and it was because of the source of water. And the trail very often went from place to place according to water sources. I talk about this place a lot. This is a stop along the old Santa Fe Trail. It's uh, Diamond Spring, west of Council Grove, one of the most historic spots in Kansas. And uh, I, if I ever think of that, sometimes I bring on a quote from a book in which the, the writer talks about this location and he says, to turn the diamond of the springs into a Concrete stock tank is the damnedest thing I've seen in Kansas yet. <laughs> and it's William Lee's Heat Moon writing about Chase County. Now, this is Morris County, but he's in Chase County just south of here, and he's basically lamenting how Kansans treat some of their historic natural resource locations. Uh, so, this is Diamond Spring. Again, it was a very well known stop along the Santa Fe Trail. 
This is one out in western Kansas, right in Red Spring. It's dry today because the water table that was lowered from the Ogallala and the alluvial uh, aquifers around Cimarron River. So even though it's a historic spot, there's no water there today. This is probably the best known spring in Kansas history, the Conda Spring. This is, uh, it used to be a hotel there and a, a spa people would go to to, uh, to cure various ailments. This is a big mound of travertine, a spring deposited rock around that spring. Uh, today that's under the, the waters of Glen Elder Reservoir. And although I have a friend from geography department at KU who says that he can take his fish finder in the boat out on Glen Elder and can find this mound of travertine today, which I think probably is a true story. Uh, this, that dam was built in the early 60s and today I'm pretty sure this would not happen. That is, this location in and of itself was historic enough for a whole bunch of reasons that I have a feeling it wouldn't have been inundated today the way it was in the 60s. Uh, this is Crystal Spring down by the town of Florence. In, uh, we're now in the Flint Hills. And let's talk about Flint Hills Springs a little bit. There's, there's John's favorite springs. This is Rock Springs at the 4-H camp down there. I know you can't see it's the left bar coming out. Of that that's what that is. And there are a lot of springs in the Flint Hills. This is the biggest one that I've seen any place in Kansas. This is uh, not too far from there. It's in Marion County, actually. And probably does about 2,000 gallons of water per minute, which is not big by standards of Missouri Springs or Florida Springs, but in Kansas, that's a big, big spring. This is all watercress that's growing around it there. It's an impressive spring. Uh, I'm looking for a graphic I want to finish up with here. This is a spring from out in far western Kansas. Let me, let me, here's what I want to show you. This pertains to you all as docents now. I'm finally getting to something you can use after <laughs> four or five minutes. Okay. Shale, you know, I talked before about water. Groundwater is found in certain kinds of rocks. It's found sometimes in limestones and cracks and pore spaces in limestone. Limestone may look impenetrable to you all, but it's not. There's a lot of pore space, a lot of cracks in there for water to, to accumulate. Shale, on the other hand, is an impermeable rock. You won't, if you drill a well, you're not going to get water out of shale. It's just too tight. Okay? So what happens, water falls on the surface of the ground. It goes down through rocks like limestones or sandstones. Then it hits the shale, and it can't go any further down under force of gravity. So these rocks don't lie flat. They're tilted a little bit. You know? Out here, you may look at these rock, these hills, and you may think, boy, those, these are flat line horizons. They look like it, but they're not. Now here, they dip a little bit to the west, very slightly, but noticeably to the west. That is, they're, you know, they, they dip down like this. So uh, a rock layer that might be on the surface here in western Kansas will be 3,000 feet under the ground. So these things dip like this. The water goes down until it hits that impenetrable layer, and then it moves laterally until it gets, finds a place to come out and comes in. We call these kind of springs that result contact springs. Because this dividing line between shale and limestone, the geologic term for that is contact, where you get that big change. So these are called contact springs, and that's what you have out here. And you can really see the things. The limestones are where the water is. And you can see the benches of limestones clearly. I know you all see them all the time. You probably don't see the shales as well because they can be grassed over. But a lot of times you can walk out onto these hills and see exactly where that water is seeping out of limestone and it's at this contact. And I think I've got some other pictures of that. Let me back up real quickly. We did a research project out on the tall grass prairie national preserve just south of here. And I bring it up because it is a very analogous situation geologically to what you all have here. We got a contract with the, from the Park Service to, to GPS in all the springs on that property. Bob Saul and I did this probably 10, years, 10 12 years ago. Uh, that is about, not quite, I think, 11,000 acres. Does that sound right to everybody? <coughs> we walked that. <laughs> now, when we got that contract, I thought, boy, this is great. They're going to pay us to walk this spring. <coughs> this is the coolest thing that ever happened to me. I can tell you that's a lot of ground, <laughs> and it's rocky, and in March it gets cold sometimes, and it, you get lightning sometimes. It was a, by the time those two weeks were over, 
I thought the Park Service owed us a lot of money. <laughs> but there are a lot of springs on that property. In that roughly 10,000 acres, we GPSed in, doing this in March and April, about 225 springs. This is the biggest one. This is one called Red House Spring, and does about 100 gallons a minute. Most of them, obviously less than that, but maybe in the five to 10 gallon a minute range. These were springs that we GPSed in in March and April. We went back in August to see how many of them were really perennial, permanent springs, and about a quarter of them were. So, that means what? Well, let me do the math again. So 220, 25% of 220 is what? Well, maybe 40 or 50 in 10,000 acres. What's your acreage out here? 8,000. So not that much different. I'll bet, and we've, looked, we've sampled some springs, and we've looked at springs out here, and I'll bet you those numbers are probably not too different from you. Uh, springs are very common in the Flint Hills, partly because of the geology, partly because it's undisturbed ground, and they're still flowing. The water quality, for the most part, tends to be pretty high. Uh, there are some exceptions to that. This, okay, this will show you. This is a picture we took after they burned that April. These are your limestone benches, and then these are your shales in between. You know, it's burned off, you know what it looks like. But, and the water will show up then at these contacts. And here's one, and I love this picture. Because this is one where the interplay of vegetation and geology is so dramatic. This yellow flower, and now I'm into your guys' work, Coreopsis? Mm -hmm. No? Don't look at me like that, Valerie. Don't <laughs> shake your head at me. No? I thought that's what Craig Freeman told me about. No? Whatever it is. <laughs> yellow flower. There, yeah, there's also a cardinal flower. I never remember that one. I can read the cardinal flower. A cardinal, a cardinal flower tends to like wet spots, yeah. right? And you can't really see it, but I remember there was a lot of cardinal flower mixed in here. These are, whatever these yellow flowers are, they like water. And look at this line of demarcation. Mm -hmm. That's where the water is. Undoubtedly, there's a shale right about here, and limestone right about here. The water's coming out of that limestone, hitting that shale, going down the side of this hill, and then your vegetation. And I think that's pretty cool. Even if I don't know what that for. <laughs> that's where you can begin to map these things out and see that connection. When we went here with Craig Freeman, Freeman got all excited because he said, those flowers don't belong up here. We're up on top of the hill. But it's a contact spring for seed. Yeah. No question. Is that what witchers look for? No. Witchers, that's a whole different topic. Then I, uh, you're free to believe them if you want to. No, I'm, I'm just asking. They, no, they're they're looking for wells typically. And they're looking for they're looking for the geology part. I don't know what they think they're looking for. I'm sorry, but I'm pretty dubious. Uh, they will tell you they're looking for veins of water. I've heard them say that. Now, but what they're looking for is where they see a, where they think there's a lot of water in the subsurface, and you can buy it if you want to. <laughs> I'm, really uh, I'm going to skip over a bunch of this stuff here and finish with a story. I'm going to finish with two stories real quick. This one, because I think these are both really cool things, and they both relate to water. They don't have anything to do with the Flint Hills, but I don't care. Uh, this is down in Kiowa County. This is a, near a, a, a drainage called Thompson Creek. And we were looking at some springs uh, one fall. And we were out there on a Friday when it was one of those warm fall days, probably 80 degrees, in, in late October, actually. Overnight, we got a cold front. And the temperature dropped into the mid-30s. It started getting one of these mists, you know, where it's kind of, the wind is out of the north all of a sudden. It's not raining, but it's not dry. You all know days like that in Kansas. So we go down to the Thompson Creek drainage, and we get down into these breaks, and all the cedar trees are covered by monarch butterflies because the butterflies have been migrating, and then they got caught in the cold, and they can't go anywhere, and they're waiting for it to warm up. And all the trees, for as far as you can see, are covered with butterflies. <laughs> it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Yeah. I mean, it looked like those pictures from National Geographic from mm -hmm. down in Me Mexico where they all migrate to. Only it was here, and it was in Kansas. And it was because of that drainage of where those springs were and the vegetation that they were all hanging out on. Uh, this is... Point of rocks at the Cimarron National Grasslands in far southwestern Kansas. This is as far away as you can get from here and still be in Kansas. 
And this is a stop along the old Santa Fe Trail. This is the Cimarron River drainage down below here. This is Point of Rocks. This is Ogallala Formation, that water bearing rock formation. This is it cropping out from the surface right here. So this is the Cimarron National Grassland Point of Rocks Overlook. And we went here in late May, uh, four or five years ago. And uh, uh, we're working on a field trip. And it was one of those years, kind of like this one, where in, uh, it was wet in western Kansas. I mean, it had been raining all spring. And during that time, this flower began to bloom. I don't think I got that. Yeah, there it is. And that is, so what is that? Galardia. 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 See, I get Galardia and Giardia mixed up. This is the good one. <laughs> so, and that one's, and the other common term for this is. So, this is blooming everywhere in Western Kansas. I mean, it's a carpet of orange out there. So, we're out here on this loop, parked about 10 o'clock on a morning in late May, only instead of the color that you see the ground being there, for as far as you can see, it's orange. Yeah. All you see is orange. Yeah. Everywhere it's orange. It's about 75 degrees, there's no humidity, the sky is blue, there's not a cloud in the sky anywhere. And I'm sitting there thinking, again, about the Oregon Trail and the Santa Fe Trail, and you read these accounts even today, and people talk about pioneers seeing carpets of wildflowers, and you all see some of that out here. But I remember seeing that phrase, it's always haunted me, carpets of wildflowers. And even, and I always remember thinking, I will never see that. I mean, I might see a lot of wildflowers. Carpets of wildfires I will never see. To this day, out there on Cimarron National Grasslands, that's what we saw. And it was, I mean, I've been a lot of places. I'll stack this corner of southwestern Kansas that morning in that place at that time up against it. It was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. And, and you know, it comes didn't back take a photo? You know, I'm not that big on pictures. I, uh, <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't, I don't mean to get too mystical, but I'm kind of one of the, if I'm taking a picture, I'm probably not looking. And for me, I can't do both of those things. So I don't take very many pictures. No, I know it's kind of a show. But uh, yeah, that's kind of the way I, where I am. So with that, I think I'm done. If you've got any questions, I'd be glad to, or, or comments or anything, I'd be glad to. Uh, you guys have been real patient, so I'll turn it back over to Greg. Thank you.